So, um, okay, so welcome to class. This is class number one. So if you're here for the provision class, you came to the right place. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. So my name is uh, Jeff Sokol, and I'm a, um, I'm a tax partner at Deloitte. Um, so I'm, I'm your professor for the semester, and <coughs> um, Anna is going to be my uh, teacher's assistant, and you, so you're going to get lots of emails from Anna. In fact, uh, just about everything we do in the class is going to be electronically distributed to you. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned in my first email, um, you'll get slides and homework problems and all the materials um, from Anna for the most part. And if you have questions, you probably mostly start with Anna, and, um, but if you can always reach me as well. Okay. So uh, two things right off the bat. Um, so tonight I have a number of like introductory type comments, but the two quick things are um, as you probably saw when I turned on the uh, slides, I turned on a little recording button thing. And that's because uh, the little pre-work video I sent out to you, so I'm going to make the same video out of classes. And uh, so right now as I talk, we're making a video of my voice and the screenshot. And you know, later on as we start doing problems in class, as opposed to like standing at the whiteboard writing, um, I'll just do problems on this instead. And it's a little slower, so I've never done this before, so this is a huge, like, just experiment. But going forward, we'll just do problems, um, you know, on a blank sheet of paper, basically online, and I'll just project it on the wall so you guys can follow along that way. And the, the end goal here, so you, you're a little more patient with the speed or the poor handwriting I have, especially on the tablet, it definitely makes it worse, um, is that you can watch the stuff over again if you want to. And you'll see that the first class is very basic, but later on in the course they get harder and there's inevitably, the class number five, I guarantee you, like a, a big chunk of you will say, man, I wish I could see that again because that was hard and I didn't understand a thing. Um, I've been teaching here for eight years in this course and every time it's the same. So um, anyways, like I say, this is the first time I'm trying to do it, but um, you know, if you guys have feedback on the videos or um, you can think of ways that I can make it more user friendly than I'm all ears. Um, I, Anna knows this. I, I saw the, uh, some of you might have seen the 60 Minutes episode that, that profiled uh, Khan Academy, or some of you might be familiar with Khan Academy, and so I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And so I'm trying to basically replicate that. Um, so that's, that's uh, intro comment number one. Intro comment number two is um, normally I'm like up and about and I'll stand in the middle of you guys and um, but tonight, not so much. I tore a ligament in my ankle over the weekend, and so it's just all bad news for me. Um, so for tonight, I'm going to be just completely seated and not moving a whole lot. The more I move, the more it hurts. So it's high direct correlation there. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, that would be great. So for starters, um, I want to go through registration. Um, so I have the list of people that enrolled who are uh, in the MST program, and I have a list of people I think are trying to uh, register through OpenU, but if you're an OpenU person, you should have paperwork. And so if you can bring your paperwork up to me, that would be awesome. She doesn't have paperwork, she's OpenU. I got it. <laughs> Translating the oops, huh? <laughs> Don't get the whole five-digit thing. But, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so then one thing we're going to do is, um, the first class is always tricky because it's never clear whether we're going to have like more people or seats. And so it looks like we're fine tonight, which is good. Um, like my favorite, my favorite story from teaching of all time is the first class I ever taught, way more people came than we had seats. And um, so we did like a lottery and the people who didn't win left. And one woman like, refused to leave and so she just went and got a chair from another classroom and put it in the aisle. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, that's impressive, right? <laughs> so, uh, she's actually a pretty good friend of mine now, so uh, <laughs> but that was how I met her, you know? Anyways. So one of the things that we're going to start off with is um, we're, Anna's going to circulate a piece of paper, and if you could just put your name um, and email address on it, then um, we'll make sure that that's our contact list. So as, I, as I've already sent stuff out to you, 
there have been a number of people that have kicked back, like, use this other email address, or, you know, you got my name wrong, or that sort of thing. And when you write your name, um, I've learned this from teaching for a number of years, that a lot of you have two names. You have, like, a, uh, oftentimes a Chinese name, and then a name you go by. And so if you have that, write both in, because usually I'll address you by one, but then there'll be another one in the school system. So put both in there so I can try to figure that out. That would be great. So we'll circulate that. Um, okay, so other comments I want to go over at the front end of class here. So syllabus. So I sent out electronically a copy of the syllabus. And um, we can go over that briefly here. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but unless you guys have questions. Okay. <coughs> so at the top of the syllabus, you have contact information for both uh, Anna and me. Right within the syllabus, there's a link to how to get the ASC 740, which is the FASB guidance we're going to be talking about. This password is actually obsolete, but Anna has since sent you a new password. So if for whatever reason you haven't been getting our emails so far, there's only been two, but if you haven't gotten them, that means you definitely need to write your email down on the list and, we'll, and maybe put a star or something next to it. We'll make sure you get the, the emails that you haven't already gotten. Um, Easily one of my least favorite parts about uh, teaching is grading. So um, that is our grading approach. So you will find, and we'll talk about this in a minute when we go through the class schedule, but um, you'll find that we have basically two big um, grading events. We've got a midterm, if you will, and then a final. Um, and then if you know of anyone who's taken this class before, uh, I think unequivocally people will say that you will participate. And I will know all of your names, and I don't wait for you to volunteer. I will call you. And um, I think Anna took my class. Ellen's taken my class before. Um, so they can tell you that, trust me, this will be interactive. Um, that's just the way it'll be. OK, so this is in the slide deck as well. So as far as the schedule goes, um, this is the last page of the syllabus, but I wanted to talk about it uh, for a couple reasons. The, uh, the first is I changed the date of the last class versus what was in the school system for scheduling. So the last class according to the school system was the week of Thanksgiving. So I just moved it a week out so that it was after the week of Thanksgiving. Because I figured not, none of you would come. <laughs> I think that's actually when I'm planning surgery for this now, so that I won't be here either. Um, anyhow, uh, so m mark that on your calendar so you're clear, because that, again, wouldn't be what you'd see from the school information. And if you can actually take it to do it, making sure we talk to the guy outside about rooms, because we need to tell them to get a room for us. There are two, um, well, the exam you can see is session seven, which is on October 30th. And if I can convince my kids to do what they did last year, they'll come in their Halloween outfits and they'll pass out the exams. <laughs> <laughs> Although last year, it was cute for like three seconds and then you guys were like, give me the exams. <laughs> it's pretty much how it went, it's about like. Um, so the exam is basically the entire class take you two, three hours type of thing. Um, but otherwise, the rest of the classes will be just typical lecture, do problems in class, that sort of thing. As you can see in the parentheticals on three of the dates, um, we have guest speakers coming to class, including next week. Okay, And I can't remember what I put in the email. But uh, one, of the, one of the homework assignments you're going to get every week in this class is uh, an assignment to read a company's 10K. And so I asked you to read Nordstrom's ahead of this week's class. Nordstrom's is pretty straightforward. And throughout the class, I'm going to have directors of companies come that um, are responsible for putting the financial statements together, at least for the tax accounting piece. And so you can meet them, talk to them about their provision. And I want you to come prepared to ask them stuff, right? Like, I read your 10K, and I thought this was really confusing. Or um, why did you say it like this? Because that makes me 
think that you were trying to not say <coughs> something or, you know, ask them questions about what was their thinking behind their financial statements. And so I've, I found that uh, you guys like dealing with real people and, you know, at companies you might recognize and see what real world provision type stuff is. Um, so next week we'll, we'll have Intuitive Surgical. Um, so if you if you guys aren't familiar with those guys, they're the company that makes the uh, Da Vinci surgery robots, um, which is a super cool thing. And, and this company, when you read their financial statements, you'll see that they just absolutely print money. Um, <laughs> like their income statement is all revenue, no expenses, and their balance sheet is all cash. I mean, it's an amazing company. <laughs> um, and then uh, in the rest of the course, uh, we'll have the person from, uh, the woman from LinkedIn that runs the provision, and we'll have the guy from Yahoo too. And uh, the guy from Yahoo, he's like my work wife. I spend more time with him than my own family. <laughs> <coughs> so, so anyways, think about that because it's kind of important to me that you guys come prepared and you, you make the class interesting. Um, I don't want you sitting there bumping a bump in a log when I have these people roll in. And so, um, so next week when you do your homework, um, definitely put some, some, some energy into it. Um, otherwise, as far as the schedule goes, one thing that's not on there is, so we are going to take the exam on October 30th. Our goal is to get you the grades back on November 6th, which is the next, next class. So that's a stretch, but normally it works. Um, you know, there's 40 of you and there's one of Anna and Ellen's helping too, so there's two of them. So um, you have them outnumbered and it's not easy to grade. And then the final, okay, this will strike you as weird, but we hand out the final on the same day you take the midterm. And the final is a take-home test, and it is basically a big problem. So it's the kind of problem you could never do in class. Uh, much like when I go work at Yahoo, for example, and you do the provision, I cannot do it in two hours, right? It is like a living thing that takes a long time. So I'm going to give you a semi-real-world type provision, and I want you to go home and do it. Um, and the expectation will be I'll give it to you on October 30th and you have two weeks to figure it out. And in that two weeks, it'll take you 20 hours max, according to Anna. Some of you will like think what happened to the max when you're spending like 20 plus hours? Maybe not. I don't know. It's big, right? It's not like a two hour thing or three hour thing. Um, so we'll give it to you on October 30th and the goal will be you return it on the 13th and we'll give it back to you graded on the last class. Okay. So I get lots of questions on grades. So I'm going to pause there because if you guys want to talk about grades, I'm at the end of what I would talk about with grades. Questions on grades? Yeah? What's, what's, oh, sorry, go ahead. What's the midterm look like? I mean, is it, is it, a, is it like the final in the sense of you want um, a provision? debits and credits and things like that, or is this a, a fill-in, or tell me, what's it look like? Uh, we'll talk more as we get closer to the uh, exam, but it, um, it's a combination of written responses and problems. Um, and it won't, there's not a big surprise factor in the, in the exam, so if you are following the first five, six classes, you will do fine on the exam. If you're struggling, then you know you should just study harder on exactly what we're doing, because it, it has less to do with the numbers and more to do with the process and your understanding of why we do what we do. <coughs> yeah. um, if we needed our grade by December 3rd for our reimbursement to fall in this year, is that at all possible? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Just send us an email and we'll get you grades. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's a typical request. That's no problem. Okay. Um, so only one time in the eight years I've taught, well this is the eighth year, so one time in seven years have I had like a rough time with a student on grades. And so my lesson learned out of that was um, to set your expectations, that if you have a grade in mind, if you want an A, like if I could just, you know, put the elephant in the room out there, if you want an A, and if I don't know your name at the end of class, and I can't remember hearing your voice, you will not get an A. It's as simple as that. That's not, to, that's not to say if I do you know your name and I've heard your voice, you will get an A. But the opposite is true. Yeah? Hi, my name's Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect, right? It's very uh, carrot and stick type of thing. All right, anything else on grades? 
Alright. Okay. So one thing, um, I have kind of three, I guess, themes to class that I, I like to talk about at the, in the first class, and that is, every week when you come to class, I want you to sit by somebody you don't know. And I realize how natural human behavior works, and some of you know each other, but trust me, one of the coolest things about this class is I make you sit by people you don't know, and in some classes you'll sit next to people that know a lot about provisions, right? And then in some cases you'll sit next to people that don't know a lot. And we'll do problems in class, and you'll do them together. And there is a skill in learning from somebody who knows more than you, and there's another skill in teaching somebody who knows less. And th if you have both those skills, that's great. Um, I sit with people at companies all the time, and the greatest skill is not knowing provisions, it's being able to explain to them how to do the provision. That is like truly the challenge. And so don't underestimate that interaction. And if you sit with your friends every time, it doesn't, you don't get there. Um, I used to bribe you with pizza, I would say. If you sit next to somebody you don't know, I'll get you dinner. And uh, they shut that down in Anna's class because the building got mad about it. <laughs> Apparently they wanted me to order through their catering, which cost a fortune. And uh, so I wasn't going to do that. Yeah, so in Ellen's class, I bought them dinner. And I did it once for them. So I'll think of something else I can like incentivize you with. But it's not really optional. Sit by people you don't know. And if you think I don't know who you know, trust me, I know. <laughs> I know how you act around people you know. Let's put it that way. So that, that's one. Um, two is uh, speak up. Okay? And what I mean by that is um, I used to bring to class until I broke it. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't have it in your class. I think I had it in yours. I used to bring this giant megaphone to class. It was like this battery-powered megaphone. And I would say that if I can't hear you when I call on you, you get one more try. And then if I still can't hear you, you talk through the megaphone. And that seems to be so embarrassing for people that by, this, by their next, their, their first free try, you know, they were speaking loudly. And to me, that's important that you have like the confidence to like, uh, you know, look somebody in the eye and give them an answer or ask a question. And I know that seems like it has nothing to do with tax accounting. Um, but with provisions, when you're doing in the real world, you need to be able to like sit next to somebody and have a forceful conversation about what you're doing and why. You, you can't be a sheep with tax accounting. You have to know what you're doing. And so um, I will often call on you and I won't hear you and I'll say, I couldn't hear you. And the reason is, is because they probably could hear you. I just want you to talk louder. And um, so that is what I will do. <coughs> Trust me, it's good practice. I used to be like the shyest kid you ever met. And um, yeah, now I'm nothing like that. But uh, Trust me, it's better to not be shy than to be, uh, you know, the other way around. Um, last thing is, like I said, you know, one of your homework assignments is to read 10Ks. I want you to think of this class as something that is not just theoretical or academic, that it's real. And one of the hottest areas in tax is tax accounting, right? And um, if you are a good provision person and you have, I mean, if you, like Tracy Hahn will be the person we meet next week from Intuitive. And if you're Tracy Hahn and you have 15 years of experience and you're good at provisions, she could get a job anywhere. I mean, that is like the spot. And it's been the spot for the last half a dozen years. Um, and I want you to appreciate that and know that, gosh, if this is what I want to do, then read 10Ks, make it real, right? Apply what we're learning in class to other companies and, and and kind of dive yourself into it a bit. Don't just kind of learn for the exam. Learn for like, if I show up and I had to work at a company and do a provision, I might know what I'm doing, right? No one will care about your grade in this class when you're out doing a provision and you can't figure it out, right? Your grade does not help you. Um, and you, I think like I said in one of my emails, you learn provisions by doing provisions. So do the homework, challenge yourself. Um, don't worry about the exam. Worry about, do I know what I'm doing? Okay, course materials. So I sent you a copy of ASC 740, so you have that. Um, that's what people used to, people my age would say that's FAS 109. That's what it used to be until like five years ago. I sent you a copy of a Deloitte book, which is uh, all the firms have these big books that basically augment the ASC guidance. 
we're not going to use that Deloitte book so much. I mean, it's more advanced, honestly, than this class is, but I'll give you reading assignments in it, mostly so you can get used to using it. Um, and if you wanted to use one of the other firm books, just let me know. I have them all, and it, they're kind of all public info. Um, but between the four of them, it's probably 2,500 pages of stuff, right? It's an enormous amount of information. And those books will be more helpful as we get into the last three classes or so when we start dealing with the more difficult topics. Those books are not helpful for the first five or six classes where we're doing basic, how do you do a provision type stuff. Okay. You, I get the comment from students all the time, what else should I read? And I'll be like, you can read this book, but if I were you, I wouldn't read it. I, I would focus on reading the ASC 740 guidance, doing the homework, paying attention as much as you can in class. That's the best thing you can do. There, there's not, unlike some of your other classes, there's not some user-friendly textbook that's prescriptive that will walk you through how to do a provision. That, that just doesn't really exist. Um, okay, so then every week I will send you slides like we did over the weekend. And then if there's in-class exercises, you'll get those as well. And then after class tonight, um, and Annie and I will kind of sort out exactly on what um, cadence we'll do this, but we'll be sending you out homework and then homework solutions. Um, the first class I taught, I remember vividly that I never did any of the solutions to our in-class problems or the homework, and the students were like ready to riot. So <laughs> now you guys will all get solutions too. Um, the idea is when you have homework, turn it in at the beginning of the next class. So you will see the last slide in our deck tonight is the homework for next week. And um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but turn in your homework. I don't really grade homework. I look at homework to see if you kind of know what you're doing. Um, like in my career, one guy, one of my like mentors when I was young, he used to tell me, he's like, there's people that are, that are on track, off track, or never seen the track, right? <laughs> so I kind of just want to make sure you're on track. And it's a big track. So, um, and if you're not, I'll try to help you. I mean, it's not meant to be punitive. Okay, <coughs> questions? That's it for the... Uh, when, when you do a um, provision, I find that I'm a, I'm a triple. I use a, a, a tax software when I do a tax return. Do you use the tax, tax, do you use the tax software to, to basically um, do your calculation of tax, or you don't, or, or you just do journal entries and then uh, subtract it from? So the if you're asking in this class, I'm, I'm asking when you do a provision, do you use tax software to help you calculate the the tax of because you basically do you do your M1 and, and pull out all the things that are untaxable and then you know it, the number comes out but you can't do that when you're doing a um, a Q or a K a, a Q or a K can you, do you do it do you do it when you do a, a, a K but you just just through the the months I guess or how, how do you do it so after yeah that's that's after thank you Susan. every quarter and then you have a yeah well we'll learn about that. Um, the answer is that, um, so for example, I spent a day at Yahoo today and they're issuing a press release on their big Alibaba sale, and if you follow Yahoo at all. And we were doing a press release content today and they would come in and in a minute say, here's the fact, change the answer, we would change it instantly, the new provision would come out. And so it's all automated, but it takes a long time to build it, right? And so, um, so you have a mo an Excel model then? With them, it's Excel. With other companies, um, like uh, EA, for example, is one of my clients, the video game company, they use a software provision package called TaxDream. And so people do different things. And um, in this class, you, I want you doing as much by hand as possible, because I want you to think it through. I don't want you to be like, spreadsheet, yeah, I don't know. Right? <laughs> Um, that is not a good answer, right? Because when you get something wrong, if you're like, hey, the spreadsheet did it, that, <laughs> right? so that doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. I was kind of almost answering my question about the homework. Do we do the homework by hand and then turn it in on paper? It's up to you. I mean, you could turn stuff in electronically, and I'm fine if you guys do stuff in, a, in, a, in Excel or some other calculation type tool when we have problems. What I want you to, some people ask me, oh, can I have an example of a provision 
calculator. And I'll be like, eh, I don't feel like giving you one because I want you to be able to figure it out for yourself, even if it's totally inefficient, right? How would you do it? Like, how would you think through how to set up step one, step two, step three? That's important and struggle through it. Um, you know, at the end of class, I'll give you examples. And when we do the final take home, you'll see I'll give you the solution in a little Excel um, kind of pre-formatted, here's a tool that you could use. But to me, it's more important you challenge your mind of how would I organize my thoughts. I don't want, I don't want you to ha be handheld by some existing tool. It's not a good way to learn. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the case study is the take home. That's right. That's right. I One of the. I guess what I'm asking is, is the fact is, is I don't know all the specifics about tax law. I only hack it being a tax guy. And I guess what I'm saying, I, the, my disability is like crush. I use the the tax program basically to put the numbers in, and it it basically says you can't do that, or it has a development issue, or, or whatever the case may be. It keeps me honest, is what I'm saying. I'm saying in the sense of because what you're doing is really calculating the tax for the company with a with some issues. You look like you know the answer before I'm asking the question, so I'll let you finish it. Well, I don't know anyone that does a tax provision by hand. Let's put it that way. So everyone has some kind of automated solution. Everyone is different. I don't have a single client that does their provision the same way. And so depending on your perspective, if your perspective is you want to be like me, I need to be able to go and pick up any pile of garbage calculator tool that some companies put together that they think is like God's gift to provisions and understand it, <laughs> right? Some companies do a great job and it's very easy to understand. But at least the challenge I have and I want you to start to appreciate and think about how to develop the skill around is how do I pick up something and understand it and process it without necessarily saying, well, I don't understand how that tool works. I want to see it the way I like to see it, right? When you work for a company, you can kind of do that. You can be like, well, I'm doing my model my way, you know? Um, but that's not how life at the firms works or whether you're on the consulting side or the audit side. Hey, if you guys in the back want to sit up here, there's um, seats up here. You can't imagine, I can't imagine you sitting with stuff in your lap the whole night. That sounds bad. Um, okay, anything else? <coughs> Intro-wise? I, I have one more question, I apologize. No problem. Um, no chance we can get a, 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 uh, an example of, a, of this Excel model? Yeah, I'll share one with you, but for the first couple classes, trust me, you won't need it. I, I'm not, I, I, it's not that I want, I just kind of wanted to see what it, what the, I have an idea. Next class, when you're sitting next to somebody you don't know, you can just eyeball for somebody that already does provisions and you can wean one off of them. Okay. We good? All right. I don't like sitting down, I got to tell you that. It's not my style. Um, for those of you guys who just came and sat up front, we are circulating a, a list, and I want to make sure I get your name and email address. So make sure that if you haven't signed off on that list, that you eventually get your name on it. And if there you, and if you, if, if anyone has opened you and you haven't turned in your stuff, um, turn in your stuff to me at some point too. Um, okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick um, introduction on myself too, real quick, um, in case. You don't know me or didn't look me up on the internet or whatever. So I've been with, I'm a uh, partner with Deloitte. I've been at Deloitte for um, almost 19 years. It's been my only job um, since college. And um, so I spend uh, all my time working with uh, pretty large public companies. Every single client I have is public. They all file these 10Ks and Qs. Uh, I think I have 14 clients. Two of them are audit clients, meaning Deloitte audits them. The other 12 are clients we don't audit, and I'm the one that helps those companies try to do their taxes so that they can get audited. So most of what I do is in kind of a non-audit space. So when we talk about like Intuitive or uh, LinkedIn or Yahoo um, or EA, those are all companies um, I help, um, but I don't serve as the auditors for those. And most, and I'll try to tell you lots of stories about the work I do with clients, but I'll always tell it to you in a way that's public information. I mean, there's lots in 10Ks and Qs you can find out. But as we're talking through class, I'll, I'll try to give you context of 
you know, I see this at company X and here's how they struggle with it or what they do or um, because I think that in theory makes it interesting for you guys to understand whether this is real in some sort of way. Uh, I have, um, like I said, I taught this class, this is year number eight and pretty much been teaching the same content, although this year we're obviously using the new technology and um, one thing about that is I think so this is a big trial. Um, I think we're going to have to record class because it's so long in like three or four segments just because the file size gets crazy large. Um, so know every once in a while I'm going to like pause and then start again just to create files. And uh, we'll see if tonight or tomorrow as I play around with those files whether I can get them uploaded and all that works. We'll just see. Um, so let's see. I've done this for eight years and... I spent a couple years in our national office doing M&A type work, but been out here for over a decade now, for a long time. And I do a ton of provision work. So if you have questions about, you know, life doing provisions and you want to just talk about it, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to share. Okay. Oh, the one other admin note I should take, I should tell you is, well, rarely do we take breaks in this class which I know sounds crazy that it's a four-hour class and we don't take breaks. Um, tonight we'll try to take a structured one. But in general, what you'll see in class is we'll do problems and it's the type of thing where I'm not just sitting here lecturing for four hours. That is not how class will work after tonight. And uh, so if you want to take a break or whatever, just take it while you guys are working on problems. Um, it's very casual. It, it is not, it's not that formal. Um, in addition to the technology, I'm using like all new slides this year. So, um, in, the pa in the past, I would do a lot of free, uh, freelance on the board, just kind of winging it as we go. Um, but this year, we're stealing a lot of firm slides, and we're going to make it um, structured to try to help, especially those who have very little provision experience, to try to make it more prescriptive in how to do a provision. Um, so, you'll, you'll see that we're going to follow the slides pretty closely, um, and a lot more closely than I would have done before. Um, but if you have comments about the materials as we go, then just let me know. Okay. So, for starters, how many of you have ever done a tax provision? Or have sat down in front of a desk and told to do a tax provision and would have any idea? Wait, you have to raise your hand more than like that. <laughs> okay. See, I'm giving you a head start in terms of who the provision people are. Um, okay, so good to know. So when we're, so we're going to start by just talking about tax return. So when you're preparing a tax return, which I'm assuming more of you have experience doing tax return stuff, or at least from your master's classes, you have an idea of kind of how a tax return would come together for a corporation. So we'll start with book income. We'll adjust for book tax differences, Schedule M's, and ultimately we'll compute a tax liability, right? You know, when my grandparents call me on April 15th and they're like, you must be busy, and they think this, right? They think tax returns, right? How do you get from kind of income to a tax liability, even though that's not really what I do at work? Um, but for provision purposes, well, we're going to start with that, right? We're going to figure out what our tax liability is, um, but that's not at all where we're going to end. And I guess the purpose of this slide is, from the most basic perspective, if all you did was figure out what a company would owe in terms of taxes, I want you to start thinking about how to reduce things to a journal entry. Okay, so the journal entry for calculating a cash tax liability would be to create the liability, right? Credit a liability on the balance sheet, and you would debit expense. So that's all we're trying to get at with that slide. <coughs> So things get complicated, right? What if you have an NOL? What if you have credits? Um, what if there are timing differences, right? You have depreciation where, you know, the tax depreciation might be slower, faster than books. So all sorts of things happen. But at the end of the day, what we're going to do through this course is we're going to reduce everything to a journal entry. Because this, this class is about tax accounting. So at the accounting part of it is much bigger than the tax part. And so, debit credit, right? When, when I'm sitting there talking to clients and an issue comes up, I'm constantly thinking, 
debit credit, debit credit. It just becomes natural. And so when I start talking about um, meals entertainment, I want you to think, like, what would the debit and the credit be for that? Okay? Good way to just constantly be processing things in your mind. Okay, okay so how many of you are working, like, out of school, earning money, stressing out? Okay, most of you guys, right? Okay. So if you work at a company and you know anything about tax provisions at that company, um, you might be familiar with the pain and suffering that people go through who are responsible for the provision. Right? So when you see Tracy on Tuesday, you can ask her, like, how stressed do you get? Because Tracy's responsible for getting the provision right. And the problem with getting it right is, you know, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, when you do something wrong, you get called out for it. And when you do it really wrong, you get kind of basic, you get basically the public, uh, you know, you don't know what you're doing statement in your 10K, right? You literally have to write in, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's embarrassing for people. So um, folks like Tracy, they get stressed out, right? It, um, tax is the number one reason for material weaknesses uh, with SOX. And it has been every single year since SOX has been around. And some people are like, why? Why is that the case? And the answer is, well, it's hard. It's way harder calculating the tax provision than it is the bad debt reserve, right? I mean, that is why there's so many tax material weaknesses. Um, but when I said before that experienced tax provision people are in demand, this is why. It's so hard. It's such a risk area. And comp public companies these days are intolerant of SOX deficiencies or weaknesses, right? That's just not acceptable. And so know that um, you know, you guys typically come to this class um, in fear of the tax provision because you know if you can't do it right, that is not good for you, right, from a career perspective. When I, uh, I teach occasionally down at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I always say that when I teach, I'll do like a one-day class or something for a professor I know down there, and the students could care less about tax provision if they don't know. And um, I usually spend the first half an hour trying to explain why they care or why they should care. But usually you guys come pre-populated with the idea that it's important and stressful um, and this is what people are really worried about. Um, when I meet with CFOs, you know, they're constantly like, I have no idea what you're doing. I just know how often it gets screwed up. Please tell me it's right. You know, and they're just nervous. So just know that's the tone around tax provisions because it's absolutely true. And the analysts seem to be asking a lot more questions of the CFO when they I, I mean, I hear that more and more. They can. Mm -hmm. um, you got to be smarter on tax provisions than, you know, when I first started at the firm, tax provision, it was laughable how to do a tax provision. Um, but yeah, nowadays, you know, even uh, the, the head of tax at Amazon, he's a good friend of mine, and um, he knows nothing about provisions. It's like his kryptonite. And he, um, He's an attorney by background. He worked in the Clinton, admin, or, uh, yeah, the Clinton administration in the Treasury. Super sharp guy. But I know when I talk to him, he feels so exposed that he doesn't understand provisions. And he's like one of the most prominent tax guys out there, but yet he worries about tax provisions. And you wouldn't expect that, but that's, that's reality. Do you tell them to take your class? <laughs> <laughs> Do I tell him to take my class? I guarantee you he will listen to some of this stuff. I guarantee you. Send him the slide. Yeah. In fact, uh, about a month ago, this is the problem with recording this class. All this kind of stuff gets in there. But <laughs> yeah, about a month ago, his kid graduated from college and was just starting at um, General Electric, and he was doing a rotation through their uh, their tax group, and he wanted a brief on tax accounting stuff. And so yeah, I was busy teaching his son stuff. But yeah, there is like a thirst for knowledge around this stuff, and it's because the stress level is so high. Okay? And I'm guessing enough of you have felt that in the real world. <clears throat> so, uh, next slide is where are taxes on the financial statement. So, how many of you actually clicked on the link and watched my video? Yeah? So, what did you think? I, it was a good intro. Yeah? Okay. I wondered how you would be able to write on, on, a, yeah. on a PowerPoint and actually it goes, you know, I didn't know how you could pull that one off. Yeah, well, now you know. <laughs> no, how do you do it? Well, I use a tablet. You just use a tablet. I mean, 
in PowerPoints you can write on the <coughs> Yeah, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, really? What I find is it's hard to write, but um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy to write. Oh, really? And um, the trick is getting the software that captures the video. And uh, it took me a while to get the right software. The right software costs a fortune, but um, now that I got it working, um, it's the software that's the key that does the video building. So that's not, that's not PowerPoint. I mean, if the, the slide's PowerPoint, but it, you're pushing PowerPoint through something else. No, you can see on the screen those like flashing corners. Um, that's the frame created by the software that just captures the image. And that software is like Camtasia something or other. And um, yeah, it just creates a, you can kind of uh, block out whatever portion of your screen you want it to create a video of and just film. That's basically it. <clears throat> okay, well anyways, on that intro video I showed you where income taxes are on the financial statement. So I'm not going to repeat that again. <clears throat> Okay, sometimes I'll just skip slides, you'll see, it's fine. Okay, slide 10. This is uh, super important. I think I mentioned this in the intro video, and that is, when, when I say tax provision, I mean tax expense, right? They're synonymous. It's always tricky, because if you talk to somebody in Europe, tax provision means liability, it doesn't mean P&L. So uh, I realize most of you are not from Europe, but um, I bump into that problem every once in a while, and I always remind myself to say it. So tax provision for us equals tax expense. Yeah. When you read ASC 740 or you used to read 1009, you used to think, okay, I'm going to read something that's going to tell me how to compute the expense. Okay. And when you start reading ASC 740, you do not get to how to compute an expense. It is not self-evident at all. And in fact, the key words in ASC 740 that you should read right away are these objectives that's in the lower half of the slide. Okay. And you'll often hear me talk about this as step one and step two. Um, <clears throat> so when you think of the objectives for um, ASC 740, this is step one, okay? <clears throat> step one is to recognize the amount of tax payable or refundable for the current year, okay? That's what we talked about a few minutes ago. Calculate how much tax you owe. When you do that, you will create a journal entry that will have a liability as a credit or a receivable as a debit. So if you start thinking of, I'm gonna have to balance an entry, you just created one side of a journal entry, right? Credit liability. The, the second step that uh, we'll have will be coming up with our deferred tax assets and liabilities. Okay, and we're gonna learn about that later in class. Bless you. But know that this is also a balance sheet account. Okay, so we're going to determine what deferred taxes we have that will either save us money in the future or, or cost us tax in the future. But we're going to stick that on the balance sheet, and that's going to be a debit or credit. Right? If we have a deferred asset, that's obviously a debit because it has the word asset in it. If we have a deferred liability, that's a credit. So, so far we have at least one debit or credit for a payable. We have at least one debit or credit for deferred. And <coughs> it would be unusual if that balanced your entry. And so to balance your entry, and what I'll call step three, but really isn't much of a step, your provision will just fall out, okay? So if you calculate how much do I owe currently, how much am I gonna save or owe in the future, then the expense for your income taxes will fall out of that, okay? And we're gonna do all sorts of problems that will illustrate this but know that that step one, step two, step three, you'll hear that like 75 times in the class, okay? I know my handwriting's messy. Trust me, it's messier with the tablet. I don't know how to fix it. But it's pretty messy on the board too, I think. <clears throat> okay, what this slide basically does is it talks about matching. Okay? When you think of how much tax do I owe on a tax return, that's really um, a cash tax concept, right? How much do I owe? And so when, when a company's accruing for your salary, you work there, they don't think, well, how much do I owe you tomorrow, right? They think, how much am I gonna need to accrue for you for the services you've performed because I'm a accrual method company, right? I accrue expenses based on the accrual method of accounting. That's how we're gonna do taxes too. 
So if you earn $100 of income this year, then at some point, if the corporate rate is 35%, you're probably going to pay $35 of tax. <coughs> that might be this year, might be next year, might be in eight years, but you're probably going to pay $35 of tax on that 100 of income. The goal of ASC 740 is to get you to book that 35 as an expense in the same year you recognize the 100 of income. Okay, so we're going to match the 100 of income with our 35 of expense. Even though we may not pay the 35 of expense, we're going to accrue it in the same year so that we have matching between pre-tax and tax amounts. Okay? Basic accrual accounting. Okay? <clears throat> I have a question. Yeah. You know, because when, when you do your tax return, nine times out of ten, the IRS files here, and, you, and it basically says, "Wait a second, we want to make sure this done is right." Then, then how do you rationalize that with the issue of if the number is wrong? The fact is, is or the IRS has known the number is wrong. You calculated it wrong. We want more tax. And then, how do you rationalize that with your with your socks when with your socks issue? Because socks is basically saying, if the number is wrong, we're going to crucify you. So it doesn't seem like I mean, it seems like the IRS is basically saying to the the IRS is saying to if we do an adjustment, your socks is wrong. So SOX has more to do with something, with whether you did something wrong on purpose or not. So... But, 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 the, but, but the calculation of the tax is, is, is the issue, is it, is it right or is it, is it different? If it's different, you, get, you say you get crucified. Well, so this is a class three topic. So in class three, we'll talk about what happens when the IRS or a taxing authority disagrees with what you think your opening position is on your return and how to account for that. that Disagreeing with the IRS is not the stressful part. Calculating a number and getting it different than what you should have gotten it because you did the math wrong or you misunderstood a theory or you just got surprised by how you should have done something versus how you did it, that is the problem typically. So a lot of times people will say, my entry doesn't balance. That is a problem. The entry will always balance, right? Or, you know, I can't explain what my effective tax rate is. That is not good, right? Those types of things are our SOX pressure points. Okay, um, slide 13. So scope of ASC 740. Um, another thing my grandmother will always say is, um, you know, she'll hear about like Amazon and their sales tax woes in the press and sh she knows I spend a lot of time at Amazon. She'll, she'll be like, oh, how about that sales tax? I'm like, I know nothing about sales tax. <laughs> I know as much as any other person that pays sales tax. That's all I know. ASC 740 just deals with income tax. So it doesn't deal with payroll tax or VAT or estate tax or anything, okay? For the longest time, I didn't even do my own tax return, and uh, I don't even understand individual taxes. So all we're going to talk about is corporate income taxes. That's it, okay? Only federal? We're going to talk about federal, state, international, but always corporate income taxes. Okay, okay this slide is key. Um, Slide 14. So when we go through some simple problems in a minute, we're going to use this, this template as a way to um, explain theories. And I want you to be visualizing this in your mind when you go through problems. Um, and hopefully it'll make a little more sense when we populate it with um, some simple examples. The idea here is that every account that you have in theory, you should be able to do an account roll forward with, right? So if you start the year with a liability here, you can do a, num a number of things throughout the year that will cause you to book an entry here, an entry here, and then at the end of the year, you should get to an end of the year balance that makes sense. And you should explain, well, I started the year with a liability of X, and it went to Y, and I can explain you know, why that happened. And when you explain why that happened, you should be able to do it in a balanced journal entry sort of way. So if you said, you know, I increased my liability, let's say by $100 here, well, you should be able to explain, well, was that because, you know, there were tax expense here of $100? And this was your debit, and that's your credit? 
I want you to think that in every row, right, there's a balanced journal entry, but each row explains how you get from date A to date B. Okay? And whenever you get stuck on something provision-wise, break it down into a smaller increment. Okay? So when we go into Yahoo and we do the provision, we don't just try to do the whole provision in one fell swoop. Like, it's not, what is the provision? It's, well, what is the tax effect of book income? What is the tax effect of this book tax difference? What's the tax effect of adding this foreign sub? What's the tax effect of, you know, having a disposition of Alibaba? Or, and everything that we do, we almost think of it as a separate row in the schedule that creates a balanced journal entry, right? Every fact you have, a journal entry can come out of that that has those three steps. It'll have a payable, a deferred, and a provision. Um, or at least we'll have two of those steps in a way that will balance the entry. Okay, so think about, as you hear facts, how would I populate a schedule like this so that I get from top to bottom in a way that makes sense and every row balances? If you're doing it in rows that don't balance, you will not end in a good place. Guarantee it. Okay, this basically says in words what I just scratched out on, on that last picture. Total tax expense is the sum of current tax expense, meaning how much do you owe now? The deferred expense, which could be how much do I owe or I save in the future? And the non-current expense, okay? And that non-current expense, it's kind of a euphemism for what you raised about a taxing authority disagreeing with you, okay? So let's say that you, you think you owe 100 this year and you think you're going to owe 50 next year because of depreciation differences. So the sum of those first two boxes is 150. If you think the IRS might come in and disagree with you and make you pay another $10 of tax, the way the IRS works, it's going to take them forever to come out and audit you, identify the issue, adjust your tax liability, and you to pay it. So everyone books that stuff as non-current because it's going to take more than 12 months for that to bear fruit. So what you would do in that example is <coughs> your provision would be, in, in that example, would be the sum of the $100 that you owe today, the 50 that you owe in the future, and you know it because of depreciation difference, plus the 10 that you might book and say, I, I kind of guess that they're going to come and get me. And I don't feel like paying it proactively, but judgment tells me I'm probably going to have to pay another 10. And this is just related to that depreciation? Sure. Um, it, things get way more complicated, but what I want to illustrate is just there are really the three components of expense that will build up to your total provision. Okay? And that non-current section works a lot better with things that are permanent items than they do with temporary, and I'm skipping over that on purpose. So don't take the example too literally, but just know that when, I, when you think of total provision, think of those three components. Okay? What do I owe now? What am I going to owe because of deferred moving in the future? What am I going to owe if the taxing authority comes and makes me uh, pay up a bit more? Okay. I think over time, the diagram in the bottom with the arrows will kind of make more sense intuitively. It's hard to explain that in words and have it make sense. So it's better, I think, to go through the examples and see if it can, it can click in your mind. Okay, why it matters. So this is your way of trying to appreciate what deferred taxes are without maybe having experience of dealing with them in the past. Oh, and by the way, um, does, I guess you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but does anyone in class work for the IRS? <laughs> <laughs> it's totally fine if you do. I mean, there's nothing secret in here. Um, it's pretty typical, probably in a lot of your guys' classes, we had IRS people, right? Yeah? Um, pretty California, too. Yeah, or FTB. Um, I think it's interesting sometimes because what... <laughs> That's great. She's empowering you to speak up. Huh? Uh, I can tell you, you want to hear the story about the one student that ever fell asleep in this class? In the seven years I've taught, only one student has fallen asleep, even though class goes to 10 p.m. It was an IRS agent. No, it wasn't an IRS agent. Um, 
But uh, we stopped class when I realized it, because I called on the guy. When I did like a no-look call. I was like writing on the board, and I called on him, and he didn't answer. And I turned around, and he was completely out, right? It was just like, <laughs> it, was not, it was not a, I'm working on keeping with you. It was, I've resigned myself, right? <laughs> and I'm like, wow, this is the first time that ever happened. Was that in your class, Ellen? I don't think it was. I don't think so. You would remember. So we stopped class and we're like, what should we do with this guy? <laughs> and um, he was just sitting there sleeping. And so we were like, we should all leave. We should start clapping. <laughs> you know, we should just do certain things. And what we decided to do was when he woke up, um, I would call on you, for example, and you would be like, I have no idea the answer to that question. But then you would say, what do you think? <laughs> and so, which is pretty weird for the student to call on the other student, right? <laughs> and um, I'm like, let's just keep doing that until it becomes so weird we can't stand it. And so we did it like four times. And the guy's name was Greg, and people would be like, man, I don't know, Greg, what do you think? And the guy's like, what is going on, right? <laughs> so we never said anything about the sleeping, but uh, yeah, at least the rest of the students had a good time with it. <laughs> so you kind of preempted my move. With your, yeah. Okay, why matters? Um, <clears throat> okay, simple example. We have this uh, Mr. Big Bucks, he wants to purchase this company. Okay, so Mr. Big Bucks is the bu a buyer, and he he's looking at this company saying, how much is it worth? And he looks at a balance sheet of this company, and uh, the balance sheet is in that shaded box below, and if you look at the balance sheet, and it has no tax accounting on it, okay? This is like a world without tax accounting, like blissful ignorance. And it says there's fixed assets of a thousand, there's a loan of six hundred, and so the book value of this company is four hundred. And if you assume that book value is fair value, right? Let's say that the thousand of fixed assets is really kind of what they're worth, then you might think I should pay four hundred for this company. <coughs> right? That's economically what would make sense until I give you more facts, right? And so this guy says, okay, fine, I'll pay four hundred for your company. And uh, now the question is, was, was that a good idea? Because we haven't considered the tax accounting yet. Right? So the assumed facts at the bottom are that we have a tax rate of um, 40% and that the tax basis of the assets are zero. Okay? So our issue is that <coughs> the day after the purchase, the buyer decides he wants to sell the assets for a thousand bucks. So he's going to use those proceeds to pay back the loan, right? And then he wants to have that remaining money left over. Um, if he sold the fixed assets for a thousand and he pays back his loan of six hundred, he should have four hundred bucks sitting around, right? That's how the math should work. So the problem is, and this is where it says in that third bullet that his accountant gives him the bad news, right? And <coughs> Down. Duh. The accountant gives them the bad news and says, "You're going to need to pay. You're going to need to use the remaining 400 bucks to pay taxes, right? He had a thousand dollar gain, so the tax authorities want their 400 bucks. So this is not good, right? He paid 400 for a company, sold its assets, and then between paying the government for taxes and paying the bank for the loan, he has nothing left. So this is not good, right? He has uh, no cash left." So then the question is, well, why did he pay 400 for that thing? Because it's not worth anything. And um, the answer, if, if you know, you can see the, the words in the, the box there, is he missed a deferred tax liability, right? When you're looking at that company, you're missing a liability on the balance sheet that wasn't there because no one had done tax accounting. <coughs> so if, if you had recorded that deferred tax liability, you'd be signaling, hey, you don't owe tax yet, but based upon the book value of your assets compared to the tax basis, it looks like you're going to owe tax. So we better put that liability on the books or somebody will mistake you for being worth something that you're not. Okay. And the example, I get it, it's pretty simple, but the example is meant to illustrate that if you did the balance sheet correctly, that the equity would be worth zero, right? It wouldn't be worth 400 because we would take, I don't know what I did there. We would take the 400 that was in equity and we would put it in the deferred tax line instead. And so if somebody saw that balance sheet, they should pay zero for that company. They shouldn't pay 400. 
Okay, so when you're thinking about deferred taxes and why do I care, that is a simple example of why economically what we're talking about matters. Actually, it's worse than that because the basis that he pays and the basis that he sells for, he has to pay tax on that too. The basis that he pays and the basis because that he sells that, for. That's a corporate tax issue that basically he, the liability wasn't recognized, but then he dumped the corporation and so he, he made a thousand dollars where the he paid a thousand and the basis was was four hundred so he paid tax on six hundred on a personal level well what would actually happen is if he paid four hundred bucks for this company and ultimately it was worth nothing because he had to use the proceeds from selling the assets to pay back the bank and to pay the irs but it's the liability of the corporation yeah. right but there would be nothing for the shareholder Right? No money would come out. So he would actually have a capital loss, which generally is pretty worthless to people. Um, but the real, the point of the example is, gosh, he wouldn't have paid 400 if he knew that that liability was there. So when you, off, when you look on the Nordstrom's 10K and you see their deferred taxes, no one really thinks of that as, oh, is that really reflective of the value of the company? Um, and it, it's not as realistic as in this example when you see deferred taxes on a public company's balance sheet, but that is why we do it, right? We're trying to reflect the fair value to the extent we can, even though gap accounting is not based on fair value, it's based on accrual accounting, right? It's historical cost. Okay. One, um, another important theme I want you to get out of tonight's class. So you learned kind of the step one, step two, step three, right? Figure out your payable, figure out your deferreds, your provision will come out. That is one key theme to walk out of tonight's class with. Um, the second key theme is to understand the difference between statutory, effective, and blended rates. Okay, this is a bit of terminology that you're going to have to just be fluid with, or <coughs> fluent in. Statutory rate. So for corporations, the statutory rate for uh, big companies that make lots of money is 35%. Meaning, if they make you know, a hundred million and one dollars, that one dollar, that extra dollar, that's taxed at 35%. That is the statutory rate. Open the code, see the rate, 35%. Okay, statutory. Effective tax rate. So you saw in the intro uh, video I made you watch that the effective tax rate is your provision divided by your pre-tax income. And it is essentially the percentage of your pre-tax income that is your tax expense, right? That is your effective tax rate. So on average, for every dollar of income you make, you pay X amount of taxes. And I can't remember what I said in the video, but um, effective tax rates in, um, in the Valley are like ubiquitous amongst public companies. Everyone wants to know what's your effective tax rate, right? So the first thing when you read um, Intuitive's 10K, you should be, what's their effective tax rate? And uh, their effective tax rate is um, kind of in the middle range of companies. It's not very low. It's not super high. Um, but I guarantee you, Tracy's boss is always under pressure for how do I make my effective tax rate lower? That will be like job number one for her. And therefore, will become Tracy's job number one in addition to not messing up the provision calculation. And effective tax rates are everything. A CFO may not know how to do a provision, but he knows how to get to the formula for an effective tax rate. And if you think about the effective tax rate calculation as provision over book income, he will come to you and say, you take this part and you make it lower, right? You are the tax person. Make tax lower. And I'll do my part, and I'm CFO, and I will make that higher, right? There's nothing the tax person is going to do to make PBT higher, usually. So your piece of the formula will be focusing on how do you make the income tax expense lower? Okay? That is the pressure on tax people. Questions? It's slide 21, yeah. Oh, it wasn't in my original email? Oh, it's probably because we added it the other night. That'll happen. 
Uh, I can <laughs> if you're getting the sense this is a well-oiled machine, it's like a pretty well-oiled machine. Yeah. So I can send you out. Uh, I can send you out another deck with that slide. We didn't change much though, so th that'll be a rare occurrence. So but noted, you're, you're paying attention. That's a socks issue. Yeah, exactly. That's a crucifixion. Can That's we right. get the nail gun out now? That's right. Uh, I understand, like, when you're explaining that as the tax consultant, or uh, what do you call uh, a number one job is to get the effective or the tax expense.